Hey fam, welcome back as we dive into part two with our epic sensory panel. Here to talk about environmental impact on behaviors, whether they're functional or distressing as all get out, more on masking and how it can lead to autistic burnout, what's just right about just right sensory systems, and when does OCD come and hijack that for its own. We're going to talk about picky eating versus RFED, capability versus curiosity, and so much more. So come learn with us, fam, because our amazing panel is back to discuss all of these questions and more. I'm Nicole Morris, licensed marriage and family therapist and mental health correspondent. And let me be the first to say, welcome to the family, the OCD family that is. I am here to create a community of support for family members, spouses, partners, parents, adult children, as there may be adult words, and chosen family of OCD sufferers and their community. I've had over 22 years of experience in the mental health field, but please note that this information does not qualify or substitute as a diagnostic evaluation, therapy, or treatment, and it is presented on an as-is basis. Please follow up with a qualified mental health provider in your area regarding concerns for yourself or loved ones. Thank you for joining us today. Now, let's get started. Fam, so how are we doing? We are about a third of the way through May. Unbelievable. And this Sunday is Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to you, fam. I know this can be a triggering holiday. We see you. We celebrate you no matter where you are finding yourself this Mother's Day weekend. But man, this this week, it flew by. And whether time is escaping you or you are slogging through the minute two hours, family, I'm so glad that you're joining us today. Because guess what, fam? You're welcome, just as you are, right here. This is a safe space for us to explore some of the benefits and the challenges we experience while doing life. And today, to that end, we are going to continue exploring the strengths and challenges we can experience within our own sensory systems, because sensory regulation and processing cover a wide breadth of our everyday functioning, as well as aspects of functioning for our OCD and OC-related disorder, or OCRD, warriors. So you picked a stellar time to hang out with the fam, but I will note this is a follow-up conversation from part one of our time together last week. So if you weren't able to join us, no worries, fam. I get it. I can't make it to every family function either, but I will recommend pausing here. Pause. Please do come back because after covering the foundation in part one, our amazing panel really dives into different questions and presentations of all things sensory across the board. So that's the plan for part two. But let me take a quick moment to remind you about our amazing panelists. This will be more of the Cliff Notes version, fam. But I will still have all the details per usual over on this episode's blog at ocdfamilypodcast.com. So check out the blog, check out our amazing panelists, but let me just do a little quick introduction. So we have our OT specialist, Dr. Brianna Pollard, OTD. And while she teaches and consults for different doctoral programs at UCLA and previously USC, she is also part of the creme de la creme of service providers at Children's Hospital Los Angeles or CHLA. And CHLA, y'all, is one of the most renowned children's hospitals in the world, fam. Not just this country, but the world. Many patients come near and far to access the incredible clinical support at CHLA. And so we are privileged to have access to Brianna, too. Additionally, we have Amber Young, LMHC, who is a fellow Hoosier here in the Midwest region of the United States and just an amazing resource to both our state and our field. Amber is our autistic OCD expert with actually a robust list of specialties, y'all. But she's really going to help highlight and amplify different sensory aspects that can also show up and impact autistic folks and within different mental health presentations. So like we mentioned last week, we are in no way reducing any one community's experience down to the presentations verbalized during our chat together today. So if you don't hear an experience similar or relatable to yours, it doesn't mean your experience is invalid. But as Amber remarked last week, if you've met one autistic person, then you've met one autistic person. For OCD, we say something similar. We say it's so individualized across different people. It's unique. And I really feel like that same understanding can extend to our BFRB and tick population too. So with that, I'm excited to welcome back Dr. Lisa Conway, PhD, to talk about body-focused repetitive behaviors or BFRBs. 
Lisa is a treasured resource when it comes to understanding the research, interventions, and the hope we have for OCRD warriors. And if you heard last week how I regaled about her fun and extensive vocabulary, she actually introduced me to a new game that I'm really excited to play called League of the Lexicon. And fam, I'm so here for it. <laughs> but beyond us bonding over our fellow word nerdiness, which of course I say affectionately, Lisa, she just has such a vibrant and powerful way of describing people's journeys, their pain, and the hope available. So I'm so thrilled to have her back to chat it up about BFRBs. And last but certainly not least, we are welcoming back Dr. Max Maisel, PhD, to talk about the broad expanse of tics, Tourette's, Tourettic, and Just Right OCD. Max is such a bright and knowledgeable colleague with so much grace for folks like me that are still trying to learn so much about this area in our field. His genuine excitement around sharing, discussing, and helping others understand, and really giving validation and humanity back to so many people with lived experience that have all too often just felt shamed or made to feel like their brains were broken or less than. They aren't. You aren't. We aren't, fam. And it's folks like Max that are able to articulate and validate that experience for people and their families. So I'm sure you can see, fam, why not only am I continuing to pinch myself for these amazing colleagues' generosity of time and expertise, but for round two, dose, of this amazing conversation. And with that, fam, let's just dive back in with our amazing crew. Welcome back, panelists. <laughs> oh, goodness. Two for two. We are going to just dive back in because like any good fam, even if we leave mid-conversation or mid-story, we're just going to pick up right where we left off. So welcome back to the OCD Family Podcast, Dream Team. And so we'd love to jump into the conversations about what Tourettic OCD presentation can look like in video games because I think this might be an interesting point that could hit with families pretty well. Yeah. The contextual nature of like tics and threat syndrome and how it's like tics and threats, it is a neurobiological disorder, but it's very much dependent on the environment. Yeah. So people notice that certain things that they do will increase the tics, certain things that they do will decrease the tics, and it's so different for different people. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes video games, often it's something our kids and teens do, which could either increase or decrease them. I, I'm curious, Max, when a, a family like notices or the person notices that it happens in a context of the environment, do you then look back and you're like, oh, what elements are in that environment? Do you analyze that piece of it then or have them reflect on what is it about that exact environmental context? Yeah, so we definitely do a functional analysis, but it's a okay. lot simpler than like a function analysis in the BFRB because usually it's like, oh, it's like stressful or they're bored or there's like pressure. It's like usually a lot like more simple. But I will say, unlike BFRBs, like I don't care as much about the functional analysis. Like sometimes it can be really helpful, but like straight up habit reversal and like practicing the skills works really well. So I would rather have somebody play a video game and practice like competing responses and riding the urges and be able to keep playing video games. Because if you have them like stop playing video games, that could inadvertently negative reinforce the ticks and make it worse. And part of the treatment is make it a very tick neutral lifestyle. But again, it really depends on context and what works for the kid and what doesn't work. But yeah, it is helpful for clients to understand what about those triggers are leading. So they could like go into situations understanding is this like a red light moment or green light moment or how at risk am I to have like stickier tick episodes? Yeah, it's interesting too, because it makes me think if we're stopping the game, we're, we're kind of creating that interruption and then that can escalate the different behavior yeah I mean, like a lot of times in if kids have really bad tics in school and classroom oftentimes what we see is the intervention that they'll come up with is like to take the kid out and go to like the principal's room and just sort of like hang out and while you can see why that would make sense it actually like will make the tick worse because their brain neurologically sort of learning oh like i get relief and comfort and like well next in my class here's some more like really gnarly tick signals so those we want to like, again, functionally to understand how that might inadvertently be reinforcing the ticks, And we want them to sort of like end up somehow back in the classroom. But there's a lot of different ways we could do that. So it's like manageable and the kid feels good and they feel like they're really working on their stuff they want to. But yeah, it's super important to understand the environmental interaction with ticks. Yeah, that is interesting. I also wonder about, so the Y box, which is the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale for any new fam joining us. And there's a side box where we have the children's version where one of the things that you evaluate on the compulsion scale will be like staring and blinking behaviors, right? 
And when we think about something like motor tics, then we can also see how staring and blinking can also be part of that, right? And so I'm kind of curious in terms of how would it be most helpful to help not only just family, but even OCD therapists to understand and differentiate when something is actually a compulsion that is functioning with an OCD or also just a motor tick or that teretic OCD where you have OCD taking advantage of a motor tick and making it worse. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really, it, it gets tricky because like eye blinking, staring, facial grimacing that we can think about as like a simple tick. It's like only a couple motor movements involved. There could be complex ticks, which are multiple sequences of complex behavior, which could look very much like OCD, but in fact be a tick, right? It could be anything. It could be biting or jumping up and down or like hitting or tapping like that could be ticks or it could be OCD. So again, this is where having something that really is informed about ticks and OCD do a good solid assessment. But for parents to start thinking about it, again, it's all about the function. With ticks specifically, it's going to be usually like a really uncomfortable premonitory urge, probably around near where like the eyes, where the eye ticks happen. I'm also mindful of the course of it, right? So like how old was the kiddo when the tick started? Usually ticks sort of change over time mm -hmm. versus OCD is going to look and feel and develop quite differently. And there'll probably be other OCD themes having to do with like scary thoughts or intrusive thoughts or other emotions that are uncomfortable. So I'm getting a whole sense of the picture and starting to kind of work out, well, what might be ticks and threat syndrome? What might be OCD? What might be something totally different? But it can be tough. And there's a lot of nuance, a lot of gray. Yeah. Air. Get back on that, Max. There's also some autistic things that there could be going on uh, in terms of eyes. It's quite common that somebody might be looking out of the corner of their eye and right. might be doing that's the stimming behavior. Moving their eyes back and forth is called eye clearing because there's this feeling sometimes of the eyes getting stuck. People report or autistic. There could be a lot of different things that could be going on with the eyes that is stimming behavior. People who are autistic also report that they can focus and unfocus their eyes at will, and that can become a stimming behavior. So again, that functional analysis is the word yes. of the day. It's, it's such an important point. And like that is where therapists can inadvertently cause harm if they're like applying the gold standard tick therapy is CBIT, comprehensive behavior intervention for ticks. And like one of the gold standards for OCD is exposure and response prevention. And those interventions do work for autistic folks, but they don't work if clinicians aren't informed about what autism means and what's like stimming or what's like an autistic trait versus what's like OCD or what's a ticket. So it's really, really important for therapists and families and the individual having these experiences to all sort of like come together and figure out like what's what, what are we going to treat? What are we not going to treat or reinforce? And can we all kind of work together just to help our kid or teen or adult feel empowered and feel more agency? I think that's at the end of it, the, the goal for everybody here. Super important. It's such a cool part of the conversation of like, how do we, with the family, with the other treatment team members, with other medical professionals, how do we get everyone on the same page so that people are working together or know enough to make a referral or to say like, how can I best support you in that versus kind of like a, in BFRBs, we hear a lot of smacking someone's hand or saying like, you're doing that picking thing again, right? Or like, oh my gosh, you're ruining your beautiful skin. It's like, it make my inside shrivel up because all it does is increase a sense of shame. May we continue to find ways to assess how these behaviors, dare I say, are functioning and, and how we can best meet those needs. The conversations like this, I think, are so helpful in fostering awareness and understanding and curiosity that we can figure out what fits best for what's presenting. Yeah. Lisa, that's a really good point because functionally, when we look at body-focused repetitive behaviors, they actually are a stem by definition. They are a stem because they're a repetitive behavior that is a stimulating behavior. Now they're a grooming behavior. So not every body-focused repetitive behavior is a stem, but not every stem is a body-focused repetitive behavior. Right. That makes sense. So when we're shaming somebody about a body-focused repetitive behavior that they're doing to regulate themselves, and they may have some shame around it and they may want to change it, if there's other regulatory behaviors that they're doing, they may also be feeling shame about those too. Right. Absolutely. A really, really good point. Yeah. I really appreciated, Lisa, you kind of say this idea of building your team. And I think for your family of listeners, it's nice to encourage them to build your team. I know from the OT side, I get a lot of families where the pediatrician or the doctor may refer to OT, right? And that's like their first exposure of learning a little bit about 
the sensory processing or the sensory needs or the stimming or the FRBs, but no OT should be just doing this on their own. At least that's how I strongly feel. You should always be in conjunction with another therapist, a mental health therapist, to be able to address this because it's so multifaceted. And so finding your team to help you through this journey is so very, very important. Yeah, that's a really great point. I really appreciate you you highlighting that. And I will just brag on Brianna that she is very, very intentional about connecting, whether it's just in general, the kind of conversation we're having today or with other patients, with other presentations and connecting with mental health, which is huge. And you don't always have that kind of outlook and openness from different professionals. And that's certainly something that we can address. Before we get into that, though, one thing, too, I was thinking about in terms of these stims and BFRBs and different sensory diets that are very normal for like what's normal. What's normal is what's normal for each of us. But what's normal for us? I also see how OCD and not only in teoretic OCD, but OCD in and of itself can really take advantage of this situation. So you might have a value driven stim. And OCD is going to come in and then also hijack and take it to a distressing level, similar to a compulsion like hand washing, right? Hand washing in and of itself, not bad. Cleaning yourself, hygiene, not bad. But we can see how OCD can make it very intrusive and scary and there can be a really unwanted outcome that's attached to it. So I know something that I do with my autistic clients is I will say, you know, do you have any stims? that you would like to have access to during treatment that will be helpful and regulatory for you. And then also we will look for and we will have conversations and be in communication about if this is a value-driven stim, then this is functioning positively for you. But if it ever gets to the point where it feels really distressing, that's where we can see potentially OCD coming in the picture. And we want to be mindful of that because we want to protect this value-driven stim for you. This isn't an objective to make you stop doing it or just habituate and ultimately mask or risk burning out because we've taken the stim away from you. And so that's, I think, an important piece to keep in mind as well. Uh, Nicole, I think that's a good intersection there. There's that differentiation between is this something that turns into a compulsion, something that is, I, I have to do this. I don't want to do this. It's ego dystonic, right? That word of like, I don't want to. Versus egocentric. This is something that I want to do. Yeah, totally. So, what do we do then? It is important to be able to build that team, and it's it's really a benefit that it can be us against this distress, us against systems that don't support our needs, and really being able to advocate for our needs. But what do we do when we do get multiple people in on the treatment team and they don't all agree? <laughs> and sometimes they, they might be very opinionated about other people on the team and their value there. And so I think this, especially in complex cases that involve multiple moving pieces, can be a huge stress for family members. So any thoughts that anyone would have on this? I always like to coordinate with other providers. I mean, sometimes for BFRBs, I'll jump in just as an adjunct therapist. That's all I'm here to do. Let me get treatment to you as quickly as possible. You stay with your therapist. So those are beautiful things because we can do this more targeted approach. And some of the affective drivers of BFRBs, the anxiety, the depression, what have you, your other therapist taking care of that more continuing conversation. Where I sometimes see kind of butting up against things. I only work with adults, but I work with a lot of college students who come to me because the parents say they need to stop this behavior. And sometimes the conversation with those students or even adults is, if you don't want to change this or now isn't the time, right? We do all the motivational interviewing approaches and this doesn't have to be the time that you do it, right? Can we have a discussion about values around it? Can we talk about, it's not just about drop this thing that has been getting you through every day of your life multiple times a day, probably you pick up instead. And if even then, it's not enough or, again, it's not the time to do this pretty intensive, repetitive treatment. That's OK, too. Right. And on the like, that's OK, I'll see you later, kiddo. And I'll like, that's OK. Come back when and if this is the right time. This is what this looks like. Yeah. And having conversations with parents about that, of you can't make them change this. Yeah. But helping to align around support of how do you want that relationship to look? How do you want communication around it to look? 
How do we help people kind of align versus just like butting up against things, which has probably been happening for a while? Well, and it speaks to that point, the importance both for the warrior in the position, whether it's dealing with a BFRB or something else, and for the caregivers or loved ones. If you need to grieve that this looks different than what you expected, grieve it. But also, once we accept ourselves for who we are and accept how our brain works, then we can really work for its strengths. We can get the supports we need in other places. Should we choose it, we still get agency and choice in that. And so I think that's also a really important point to remark. But so many times I think some of that shame continues to be internalized because I think, well, I can't help this. But we all have our different limitations. This doesn't make you less than of a person. This just means, hey, this is how your brain's braining. Understanding that gives you better strategy for how you can function, what's going to feel more regulating, what's not. And that's okay. We're all different people. We're going to have those differences, whether we have OCD or not, or tics, or whether we're autistic or not. Like, it's true for all of us. Can I piggyback off of what Lisa was saying as well? Like the tics and threat world. So I, I work with kids, teens, adults, a lot of the people I see with tics are kids and teens and probably like maybe like 50% of the phone consultations I do with parents, we end up like not choosing to treat the child with tics because it's, it's so important for the child to feel empowered to make those changes if they want to. Mm -hmm. And if the, the kid might be taken, it might not be bothered at all. In fact, like I've seen a lot of kids, like their friends are super understanding and no one really cares, but the parents really care. And that's going to make the tics so much worse, right? Not only is it going to in increase the pressure and anxiety, that the kid or teen feels not to tick, which is the last thing that, <laughs> that will help the tick. But it'll also potentially hurt the like attachment to the relationship. If the kid feels criticized or feels unwanted. Now, if the ticks are bugging them and bothering them, and they want to change. Yeah, we have some amazing, really powerful behavioral strategies to help them. But if they don't want to, that's more of like the parents' work. And I do work with parents. So like, well, how do we, how do we accept? How do we really like, support my kiddo? And like, we could talk about ticks and talk about what it's like to be a kiddo with ticks and have space for that, but without needing to change anything. Like having the kid live like their best, full, rich, meaningful life with ticks, right? If it's not bugging them, it's not bugging me. And if it is bugging parents, they need to do their own work to sort of figure out, well, how do I navigate this? How do I let go and like let my kid be my kid and thrive to the best of their ability? Yeah. Matt, you do a version of almost like space for that, the support of parenting of anxious childhood emotions. Yeah. Right. It's like, how do I help you exist as, as a parent in this relationship in a way that's useful? Yeah. And, and space. Yes. I, I love space for working with parents, with kids and teens with anxiety and OCD. I'd say the biggest difference, though, with like anxiety and OCD, you're really helping parents intervene and help sort of like build the skills that their kids have to manage OCD and anxiety versus takes. It's more of like, helping parents have the skills to like step back and not do anything right? <laughs> like really fully, truly not do anything other than creating safe space for their kids to feel comfortable talking about their tics if they want to. Right. And parents can certainly, I don't want it to be like, oh no, we can't mention tics. No, like it's good to talk about it and check in occasionally, just like we would with anything that's happening with our kid, but not in a way that's like driven by anxiety in a way that's driven by our values. Like tics seem to be going like everything. Okay. You want to talk about it? If not, that's cool if you want to. So just like being like having a real conversation, but not forcing them if they don't want to. And knowing that there is treatment out there could really help kids just know, oh, like if it gets worse, then there's things they can do to help. But right now it's not a problem. So that's okay. Yeah. And that reminds me of BFRB treatment too, Lisa, because it's very much, right? It's not how can you get in here and solve it? Let's actually ask the kid what they want. Maybe they want you to completely lay out of it. And it can change. It can be a moving target. And so it points to the importance of communication, which it's, I think just a family systems problem that has been around as until as old as time that it's hard to have conversations around these distressing things. But if we really can strip away the shame and say, and our support needs are going to change around that. So this week I might want you to be like, you got this. And next week I want you to not sit there and laser focus on the, oh my gosh, you're doing the tick or doing the BFRB or doing the thing this week. I think the core difference with tics, with Tourette's OCD, and with body focused repetitive behaviors is that is that person's body versus OCD and generalized anxiety and other anxiety related disorders, phobias tend to draw the entire family into, and you can become a part of accommodating all of those behaviors. You can become a part of that and your time can become like involved in all of that. So I, I think that that's kind of the main difference in where, Lisa, as you mentioned, space, I'm a big, 
user of space. However, we talk about sensory things, like obviously I'm not going to use it if it's a sensory issue, but when it comes to an anxiety or OCD thing with parents, if, especially if a child doesn't want to be involved or a teen or even an older adult that's living at home, I'm going to help the parent with space. And, and that basically is working on supportive statements of, I believe that you can handle these big feelings. They may not be capable of doing the thing, but you're saying, I believe you can handle these feelings. I believe that you will get through these feelings. I'm here for you. And I think that's important. Well, in that parallel process for the parent to remind themselves, and I can also handle these big feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have big feelings about them having these feelings and, and these experiences. And a lot of times that's a big piece that we have to address. Yeah. What an amazing and privileged role we get to play in helping to support these conversations differently or helping support the different members of the family. When I can get a loved one in the virtual room, it's awesome because sometimes it's helping someone learn the way you are trying to help isn't the way that help is being received, right? The, the help could be, I just hand you a fidget, or the help could be, I love you, or the help could be, I just shush and I deal with my own big feelings, yeah. right? It's having those conversations differently. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that exactly what Lisa said holds true for tics and, and Tourette syndrome as well. And a lot of times, like the big feelings that parents have, like when they see their, their kids ticking, and especially that's why like, providing education to parents is such an important part of it. But it could very easily lead parents to do things that inadvertently make the takes worse, whether it's like pressuring their kids or like overcoddling them. Because again, remember, ticks, it's neurological, but ticks are very responsive to the environment, right? And our brain sort of like not an intentionally thing, but our brain kind of learns when to take more, when to take less. So part of like using the space approach, again, if the kid doesn't want to change, we're not stopping the ticks, but it's more of like, how do we help parents manage their own stuff to neutralize it and like let them not add fuel to the tick fire, so to speak. Amber, a real quick question. Again, as a mom of autistic kiddos and just within my client population, I hear this come up a lot, especially around masking. Can you speak a little bit to the difference between capacity to function yeah. and masking and how that plays in? Yeah, so masking is when somebody basically is foregoing or rejecting a part of themselves to be accepted, to fit in, to not be questioned, to maybe be safe. It may feel not safe. And this could be in regards to behaviors like stimming. It could be facial expressions, modulating their facial expressions. It could be modulating their voice, particularly women, like raising their voice versus lowering their voice, speaking at their actual voice tone. It could be not having things around them that bring them comfort. It could be wearing clothes or things like that, that they're told to wear, even though they're uncomfortable looking or presenting a certain way. It could be just things that we in our society might take for granted as these are things that everybody does but for that person are very uncomfortable and continuing to do it. And autistic burnout is different than occupational burnout. Autistic burnout it is continuing to do this and operate in this way where you are continually operating above capacity. You're continuing to stretch yourself. Quite often, I discuss with my clients that not everybody gives 110% every day. And a lot of my clients are like, what? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. And I'm like, no, no, they don't. They don't. Most of the time we give an average of 80%, 50%, 90%. And a lot of my autistic clients give 100% every day. That's burnout. Yeah. It's just like common sense that at a certain point, if you're pushing yourself beyond your bounds, something's going to get right. And not in a way that's going to feel beneficial to you, but in a way that's going to feel catastrophic, right? Absolutely. But a lot of my autistic clients have a very strong sense of social justice and a very strong drive to just be honest and a very good person. And that also is another thing that we have to tie apart. Is this an OCD thing? Is this a existential OCD? Am I a good person OCD? Or is this a feature of your autism? Yeah, and it's such an important piece because part of what we do in OCD treatment is we really want to externalize this as not being you, this distressing thing, right? And so if it's commingling, and OCD is that opportunistic jerk that does commingle, right? 
and and take opportunities, then you could see how difficult that could be. And we know as therapists, but also just that piece even that Brianna was talking about where everybody's going to have their own sensory system. And so if you have two sensory systems that clash, autistic or not, if you're thinking about, well, my mom gets really upset if I don't address her this way, and it may be a sensory difference, but now I have to mask and I'm not really getting what my need is that helps co-regulate me because I know it's going to set her off. And so we can already see how that sets up this very toxic precedent that the way I feel isn't okay. And then that can really lead to that building of mistrust in yourself. And so part of even within OCD treatment, whether we're doing traditional exposure and response prevention, or if we're doing inference-based CBT, where we're starting to distrust some of our, our different sense data, we can see how within the autistic population in particular, there's already this bias, this kind of societal built-in bias that is changing, but has a long way to go, where you might distrust yourself. And I would imagine that could show up too with, within the TIP population. Would you agree, Max? Yep. Yep, absolutely. And I think all, all this stuff has a way of like integrating, relating to one another. That's very true. So that leads us into conversation and we've covered to some extent pieces of this, but I'm thinking even within the framework of just right, how do we look at the difference between our engine, that thermometer, that thermostat that we were talking about across the board, whether we're talking about this is just normal integrated sensory diet, whether we're talking about in terms of a tick stim, BFRB, who would like to offer some thoughts on that? I can jump in first. So I think it's so important to look at the context, right? Because it's not just one specific experience or symptom. There's a lot of other things going on. So for example, if somebody has just right OCD, let's say they have to like turn the light switch on and off, on and off over and over again in order to like clear out the feeling of just right. If you just look at the behavior of flipping a light switch over and over and over again, just like everybody has been so beautifully saying it's all about the function, right? And like that specific behavior of flipping a light switch could serve a ton of different sorts of functions. And OCD specifically, I'm looking at the function of like, is there like the debilitating, crippling, really overwhelming sense of like unease or yuckiness of emotions? And this person feels like they need to make it go away with then some intrusive thoughts probably about it lasting forever. How am I going to live a rich, meaningful life? Unlike other sort of like sensory processing disorders, there's going to be a lot of like broad sensory difficulties in different ways, OC is going to be very targeted and specific, right? And they might be mindful of other OCD themes that they've had throughout their life and how that's related. So I'm like looking at the broader picture of like, okay, like, is this looking like it has an OCD flavor? Is there a sensory processing flavor to it? Because we are going to work with those things very differently. I don't know if I answered the question, but those are, those are some initial thoughts I had. Yeah, no, I think the context is really important because I was just thinking, too, whether it was Brianna or Lisa, we were all speaking to this, uh, Amber as well, that you might have this sense of unbalance or imbalance, rather, right? And that may lead to that general feeling, right? And so now it's, can I get some relief from this general uh, feeling, which we can see in just right OCD, it could have a more externalized intrusive thought, like if I don't turn my head this way, this could bring harm. But it also could just be that feeling of imbalance or that really interceptive cueing, just feeling not right. And so it becomes really complicated because just the symptom, just the presence of the urge on its own doesn't tell us the FRB, OT, take this, that. Sometimes we really need some broader context in that, right? Yes. And like, and knowing the the person is really important. Like if they're autistic or if they're neurodiverse in different ways, I'm going to be immediately thinking, okay, what sort of like sensory processing stuff might be playing into this versus a neurotypical person. I'd still be mindful of that, but I'd be like, really, how are we going to differentiate this from that? And yeah, I think if the person has a history of other sensory processing difficulties, I'm going to be sort of thinking more in that bucket or history of OCD. So I think, yeah, taking that all into account, it is, it takes some time and patience and curiosity, I think, above all else. Yeah. And just like in other areas, where is this productive and helpful for the person? And when does this become distressing as well? And, and just even saying that out loud, Lisa, I was thinking like, well, BFRBs, right? 
Totally. Totally. Well, and phrases that the family may be familiar with too, the egocentonic versus egodystonic. So egocentonic, broad strokes, like it makes sense to me. It's something that I like, that it that is consistent with values roughly, right? Versus egodystonic, it, I'm really fighting against it. I don't want it here. And a lot of shame that comes along with BFRBs is there is an egocentonic component where people will cancel plans in order to have time to engage in their BFRB. A phrase, I think it's from the eating disorder literature, is shame breeds in the dark. And so when a behavior is kind of driven underground, especially when, like we've been talking about, the I don't want to see you doing that. Or like, oh my gosh, you're ruining your skin. Or like, look at your beautiful hair. If that's coming from a loved one, a parent, what have you. Oh my gosh, all the person with the BFRB is learned is like, I'm not supposed to do this. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to keep it a secret. And so finding space around how do we acknowledge, here's the pieces of this behavior that are serving you. And to what degree do you want to engage in it with regulation like some mild grooming skincare routine, like occasionally going after what looks like a zit you could easily pop? When does it feel dysregulated? Because if we're looking at some of the cues that come along with BFRBs, I think it was a Pringle slogan that like, you can't pop just one yeah. or something. That is like BFRBs to the core. It always said like, you just, it's just this one or like, just finish this. And 20 minutes later, someone's bleeding. And feeling deep wash of shame. Yeah. And so it, a, a way that I really like to talk to people about it is I, I borrow it heavily from a colleague, Jason Yu, who has a lived experience of having a BFRB. He co-facilitates trainings with me for clinicians to do work with BFRBs and hosted the podcast Fidget. Yeah. And he made a short animation called Low Fuel Light. And so he had said something that really shifted his perspective was seeing his BFRB not as a problem, something to be mad about, but instead indicate that like, I'm running out of gas. I'm not going to get mad at my car if I'm running out of gas. I just need to find another way to fill up. And so kind of similar to the idea of like spoons theory, how much have I got in the tank right now? What are other ways that kind of bring me back into that regulated state that meet those needs so that I'm not fighting against this thing that I do, this thing that I sometimes like, this part of myself, I'm using it as data that's coming in and how do I want to sit with it? And that is so beautifully aligned with acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT and just helps people, I think, to make more space for and accept these things, not in a like, I'm so glad this is my thing kind of way. And yet like, okay, this is my thing. And so how do I want to be in my life when this is my thing? I think that speaks to the piece of sometimes, especially across the span of different professional worlds, it's so easy to over pathologize different symptom presentations, right? And when sometimes we're just talking about like, this is my thing and that's normal for me and that's functioning normal for me. And, you know, we would love to then end, Brianna, if you could speak just to a part of the normalcy that we have around certain sensory input we're going to have aversions to, certain things we're going to feel neutral, certain things we're going to see. And they can change over time. Like I loved spinny rides when I was younger. Do not even like twirl me now because I'll be like, oh, I feel a little, a little seasick from that. So my vestibular input has changed a lot since I was a kid. And I feel like that's probably pretty normal. But I would love to hear more on just kind of the normal span outside of pathology. This is just part of how we function. Right. And for your example, like vestibular, it served a purpose for you as a child. Vestibular helps you develop balance and your sense of gravity and space, right? Your relationship to gravity. So as a child, a new walker, like actual walking, you're new to this world and you're trying to experience it and develop your sense of habituating to sensory stimuli, right? So as children, all children seek out spitting. All of them do to a degree, right? All babies like spinning objects. They all do because it's exercising their vestibular input. A lot of children who can't motorically move because of some traumatic brain injury because of birth history, maybe they had an insult to the brain and now have developed cerebral palsy, right? Motorically, they can't move. They're going to be delayed in their motor skills because of what has happened. They are still going to seek out vestibular input, but you're going to seek it through vision because it's their way of developing it. So they're going to seek it through watching spinning objects. We all do. But as an adult, you don't necessarily need to exercise that anymore. You should have a pretty good development with your vestibular system. You understand how it works. 
So you now get nauseous and that's why it's all linked and how it interpreted in the brain that even just watching someone now, you can get nauseous by something else spinning because you already know what that feels like. You have a good sense of that. And so understanding, yes, it changes as we go. I think when you brought up at the very beginning of this piece about sensory regulation, getting to that just right, I think understanding not only the sensory input that is being felt, you engage in these uh, BFRBs or these other behaviors, right? But also understanding the sensory profile of that each person. So what is it during that behavior that feels good, right? So if you brought the hand washing, right? There's this compulsion, it feels good to wash your hands or to wring your hands, but then you feel like it's not clean enough and you get the anxiety and it's not off, it's not off. There's that contamination issue. Then I'm going to suggest that we're going to add deep pressure when we're washing your hands. If that's what your body needs is to feel it, we're going to give deep pressure because that tactile light touch feeling that happens that then gets locked into our brain that like I'm still contaminated, I can feel it, starts to dissipate because it's deep, deep, firm pressure as we wash our hands. However, I'm also going to look at the profile and be like, okay, so I know that there's elements of deep pressure that they may like. Um, maybe the person, as they move about their body, they just don't feel as grounded in their body. So what activities do they like that we can have peppered through the day that will give them that intense sensory stimuli to help their body be more regulated? And hopefully that will help with the emotional regulation. And so we create somewhat of a sensory diet. And not just like throwing fidget toys or put them on a therapy ball in the classroom or at your desk, but more engaged, meaningful activities that can help regulate. And I keep going back to dance because of somebody I know who has OCD. And that is when they feel the most authentic of themselves is when their whole body is very engaged. That helps them regulate and start them off. Also, it's the sense of music and how it puts their life in rhythm. So engaging in more of that has helped be able to combat some of the intrusive thoughts that they have that goes on throughout the day. So when they pepper that in, that has helped them stay more regulated, but those are the sensory components that I'm looking at. Now, does it fix the OCD or the intrusive? No, but that's why this goes in conjunction to other therapies, right? That everyone here is talking about, but it's one element to help set up a little bit more for that person to feel regulated and feel more connected and hopefully expand that thermostat just right temperature for that person. Yeah. And if I'm understanding you correctly, it's similar to, and for any fam going like, wait a minute, should I be doing deep pressure? I mean, it, it depends on your sensory profile. Again, yes. But in a way, it's almost like saying that deep breath. So if you have a complex sensory system, as we all do, and you find that deep pressure already helps. This is essentially just saying like coping with life strategies, right? But understanding what works best for you from a sensory perspective and then bridging that, working together then with professionals that are going to understand the pieces underlying the intrusive thoughts or how OCD is functioning, that's where we're going to have the best response. And one of the things too, as you were talking around the spinning, that was really interesting learning about even the visual ways of taking in that vestibular input. I was thinking of whether we're talking about autism or ticks maybe at an earlier age, maybe we start to see some of those repetitive behaviors and it's very, very regulatory. The stereotypical behavior can feel very soothing. And so whether it can be a part of a stim or a motor movement or all of the above. And so would love if Amber and Max would have any thoughts to add to that. Uh, sometimes people might misinterpret visual stims for OCD. For instance, again, when I'm looking at distinguishing what's OCD versus what is part of a visual stem, I might have a client who says, when I'm doing Y-Box, oh, I do like to organize my clothing in, in hanging it certain ways. But we will talk about that word of ego syntonic, ego dystonic. Tell me about the way you organize it. Well, I like it rainbow order. What happens when it's not in rainbow order? Well, it, I just, it doesn't feel very good. I don't like it. It doesn't cause harm, but it looks pretty. I like looking at it. It might be a stem then. It might be something that brings you joy. Sometimes we refer to those as autistic glimmers. They just, they bring you joy. You know, kind of like a little sparkle. I like um, that. So, 
I love yeah. glimmer. That's one thing that I do with clients too, is ask them to write down their glimmers. They're small little moments, you know, but lining things up in a certain order. For me, I, I do have very vivid memories from a child. Everything would be in rainbow order. If you were to interrupt it, wouldn't make me upset. I would just be like, oh, okay. Before Pinterest came out, I had files on my computer of pictures that were pretty. And before that, I had binders of pictures that were pretty. So sometimes you might have aesthetics, people who look at pictures that are beautiful to them. You might have people who look at light switches or lights turning on or off, or again, just things that are visually stimulating could be a stem. So again, you can think about visualizing and being sensory averse where light is too much. I'm very sensitive to light. Too much light is intense. I mean, I get migraines pretty bad, but also I will stem and I didn't know it was stemming. I just like to look at pretty things <laughs> or rainbow order or things like that. So that doesn't necessarily mean a person is autistic or neurodivergent, but if you find that somebody is doing that quite a bit, that might be a sign of neurodivergent. And we certainly want to want take that away. That's functioning as a stimulating and healthy behavior. Right. Very good point. Max, anything you would add to that? Yeah, for sure. So the classic tic disorder, chronic motor vocal tic disorder, Tret syndrome, they're inherently not stimming. It's inherently it operates based off of negative reinforcement principles, right? So it's like a buildup of the promontory urge and it's relieved in a tic. But Unlike other forms of neurological disorders, for say like Parkinson's or other things like that, tics specifically are very responsive to the environment around them. So oftentimes the environment will really affect how much somebody is ticking or not. For example, a very common trigger for ticking is stress or anxiety, also boredom, frustrations for bigger emotions. And the tics aren't happening as like a stimming necessarily, but it is their nervous system sort of like building up energy and reacting to that as coming out as ticks, which then can alleviate some of that temporary anxiety or stress, but then it also sort of reinforces the tick patterns down the road. And that's why part of tick treatment, it's not only the behavioral intervention of using habit reversal therapy for the ticks, but it's like everybody's saying, doing a good functional analysis and understanding how the broader environment is affecting tick presentation. And then to be able to work from there, we integrate a lot of other sort of treatment, a lot of relaxation therapy, a lot of stress reduction, social support, um, acceptance, commitment therapy. We sort of do whatever we can once we understand the interaction between the environment and the ticks themselves. I've read some anecdotal stories and first person stories where sometimes people who are in like high pressure jobs can hold it together. And I was thinking of a, a surgeon that I've worked with in the past that was pretty amazing, but then his ticks would come out afterwards. So during less pressure situations, like parent interactions or recovery room, that's where it would come out. Max, is that common or is it considered an overflow? There have been studies on that showing that like generally the suppression theory isn't how it works. It's like a context thing. Like a kid might not take it all at school because the context is different they get home. And unlike, it's not like being built up and coming out. It's like the context change that might feel safer or more open. Although I have worked with people, again, like swear that it does build up and who am I to say, but like the research generally shows. But for, Brianna, for your specific instance, like I would probably think it's more of like the stress is the trigger instead of it building up and like suppressing or not. It's like the stress might have like triggered the ticks, not like a suppression. That's how I would sort of think about yeah, it. Like, okay. Like someone's like, no, it's building up. I think, okay, that's your experience. Like the research <laughs> doesn't cover everybody, but that's how I kind of like to think yeah. about things. It's an interesting point too, Max, because I think sometimes when a person functions one way in one setting, as we know, because we were just describing how environment plays a big role, but that the word capability, which is like almost a dirty word at this point and frustrates me to, to no end. Someone will say, well, they're capable in this setting and they do fine in this setting. So it's attributed to a behavioral response or, I mean, obviously you can have outward behavioral. So it's not to say that in and of itself is a bad response, but people mean it in more of a, like a defiant behavioral response or an acting out response and oppositional response. And it really, it's frustrating because there's no literature saying like it can't function in different environments in different ways, right? It's heartbreaking to ascribe that kind of willfulness. Yeah. Right. Because then it just further engenders that sense of frustration or a sense of hopelessness. Like, yes. man, alive. 
Yes. Another phenomenon too that piggybacks with that, and it is a new diagnosis that has been proposed, which is called PDA. And the term, the language in terms of what it actually is going to be is up for debate, pathological demand avoidance, pervasive demand for autonomy. There are a few different ways, but essentially it's that the person has a very, very strong internal sense and need for autonomy. And when somebody places a demand on them, whether it's an overt or a covert, it could even be a demand they placed on themselves, a request. It doesn't matter how nice you say it. It may not even be something that is very large. It could be something that they, quote unquote, are capable of doing. But if threatens their sense of autonomy, it's not a conscious thing, but their nervous system goes into fight or flight and they may shut down. They may lash out. They may react in many different ways. And so that is a very real thing that many people who are autistic report that and report that it's a battle sometimes even with their own self. And I think NHS has even approved it for treatment, but we are behind on that. And I have seen just even in the literature I have reviewed and hearing different people's experience with addressing the concerns that are highlighted in a PDA profile has been so incredibly helpful. And I think for the OCD field in particular, so many times when people are feeling that overwhelming amount of distress, their body is going into fight, flight, or freeze. And that's so similar to then what PDA is describing. It's something I've also talked with Dr. Anthony Pinto about when it comes to obsessive compulsive personality disorder, because we can also see that show, Amber, you were like, she got feelings. A lot of people have feelings, especially where OCPD and autism can overlap. And it may just even be a spectrum like we described with OCD and Tourette syndrome, where we have on one side and it's along the scale there. But to that end, yes, I think it's really important to see how our nervous system is reacting to that and whether we can adjust it, whether we're looking at the thermometer or a gauge or a dimming system, as Dr. Pinto would describe. And so, yeah, it is a really interesting conversation. Because even as we were talking earlier with Amber about the difference of capacity to do something versus chronic masking, you're talking about the environment having such an impact, right? And so sometimes it's confusing because I'm sure you hear caregivers, teachers, people, partners, spouses going, well, in this environment, they don't do that. And so they have the capacity to not do it. But in this environment, they do it all the time and they act like they have no control over it. I've seen it. So I know they have the capacity. The C word, it gets thrown around. So what are your thoughts on that kind of statement? Yeah, well, it's a gross misunderstanding of like how ticks works, right? And how neurology works. It's because the environment and the context like kind of changes in a work. It doesn't mean the person has more or less control necessarily. There's, there's so many different things to take into account. And and unfortunately, I have heard that a lot and it's very invalidating for many people ticks and it can make the ticks a lot worse because then they feel pressure not to tick stress. in certain circumstances and yeah, more stress is going to lead to more ticks. So I like to do my best to make sure people understand how ticks work, that they're not like doing it on purpose. It's not like what we're talking about here at all. But another important piece is that environments can also condition ticks inadvertently. And that's why we work a lot with parents and schools and family systems to help understand how responses from other people might be making the ticks worse. And that very much includes critical hostility, trying to encourage people to suppress ticks. That's going to make ticks worse. And there's a lot of things we do a good functional analysis to help people understand what is making ticks worse from the outside environment. That is a big one for sure. That sounds interesting. That's something I would, I would love to hear more about, but I'll have to do it at another time. But that is that's fascinating. And Lisa, one of the things, too, that I was thinking about was this capacity. We see this in BFRBs, too. Sometimes people conflate the goal to never pick again, never pull again, never cheek bite again. And maybe they went three months. Maybe they went three weeks. Maybe they went three days. So they have the capacity to not do it. I hear that sometimes come up, too. And there's a real danger in we're setting ourselves up for failure if we're saying our brain is never going to brain. This is a neurological thing, right? And so we'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You're so right. And it breaks my heart. 
because now that pressure to to a more extreme sense, like the shaming that can come from the external environment and people, now the call is coming from inside the house. I am telling myself I should be able to stop because I have before. And maybe it's before a big event, I could stop to get my nails so I could get a manicure before a big party, right? Or the like, you know, I, I just really doubled down and I was able to not pull for a little bit. And yet, again, because I don't want to oversimplify by any means the idea of addiction. They are finding some, with this brain research, interesting overlap between BFRBs and addiction. And yet, if it's alcohol, it's a substance that we can keep out of the house, right? We can create a clean environment, albeit that's a gross oversimplification. You can't get rid of parts of your body that are there all the time. Like you said, a brain is going to brain. So how do we help you anticipate cues, prepare a cope ahead? So we're doing both proactive things to help, some prevention strategies, and then reactive things, some interrupters of these behaviors. Because those first calls I'm always talking about, like, I'm not going to tell you that you can stop. And anyone who tells you that, now we're about, like, oil salesmanship. Run, run. Right? It's just not possible. Exactly, exactly. Because now we're chasing a dragon. Like, that's not going to happen instead. Let's talk about how to start regulating this and let you learn these ways of surfing the urgence of the BFRB. And again, this beautiful space, it climbed the line with me on it of that low fuel light. I now have a signal to me that I need something, that I'm feeling disconnected or lonely or stressed or overwhelmed. When I'm getting a lot of BFRB urges, whoo, I can now listen to myself differently because I know I need something now. And so really working through that space to decrease that shame, much less get rid of that like control and elimination goal. Yeah. Taking away the stigma and just saying, oh, it's my body saying I have a need. Yep. Yes, like, absolutely. That's huge. Can, can I piggyback off of yeah, what um, I think? Because it's so true with like takes as well. And if somebody reports or the parent reports that the kid is not barely taking it all at school and taking around at home and they use that C word, like, oh my gosh, like they have the capacity for it. But what, why can't they just like not take it home as well? Well, for me, it's like, well, there's a reason that they're taking more in one place and not in the other place. And instead of like criticizing or saying that the capacity, let's get really curious as to what's going on. And maybe they feel safer at home and they come home, feel safer to kind of like go and then they face like criticism and suppression. That's not going to help anybody at all. So just just like Lisa, really helping understand what is the difference, why somebody might be taking here or not there. And to be curious and compassionate and work with the kid, the teen or the adult to figure out what's going to work best for them. What changes do we want to make? or not make? And how can they feel most empowered to do that work for themselves? Yeah. And it's one of the beauties of, I, I think, learning more about ourselves, learning more about how we're all sensory beings too, because in some ways then we can learn whether there's some kind of emotional, I'm sure it's it's usually a combination and really just one thing. We don't live in a Petri dish, but whether it's an emotional meaning that we're applying to and experiencing our stress through or whether it is literally something within the sensory environment that is adding more distress and dysregulation. And so it's a huge piece because if we're not understanding, sometimes people think, well, behavior blocker, that's the answer. And it's similar in, in that addiction model to being dry but not sober, right? Like we can withhold, I guess we all have the capacity to withhold at a certain point or mask at a certain point. But then if we're not really addressing the need, then we're going to continue to feel that pressure build and build and build until there's some kind of collapse. And it's generally not going to feel good or be experienced as a positive thing for any of us if we're not having that need addressed. It's interesting, too, because as we talk about visual stims and different visual processing, sensory processing, this comes up a lot, I would say, for kids in school, too, because Sometimes the issue is there's way too much visual stimuli. And so you see how all these bright colors and beautiful examples of different learning skills have their place, but we throw it up all in the same room, all in the same line of vision. We have somebody that, whether we're talking autistic, allistic, we can all get, like our, our nervous system can get dysregulated, it can get dampened by everything we're taking in. And so the answer isn't to go, you need to do this the way I said to do it. You're not responding. It's to be curious, like you were saying, Max, and go, I wonder what it is about this environment that's hard. Maybe it's not just little Jimmy wants to be defiant, but maybe little Jimmy is in fight, flight, or freeze right now because of so much 
different input and stimuli or not enough input and stimuli. And so it really begs the question to be curious is generally going to lead to positive things in life if we just explore the meaning. It's a simple thing, and yet it's so commonly missed, I would say. What do you guys think? Absolutely. I think that's just the way we have to look at a lot of it. And when you're going into these different environments and looking at what it could be as being curious, because it changes, right? Like just at the beginning, we were saying, well, it changes with age. I mean, it changes depending on if we got good night's sleep. Like I think Lisa mentioned, making sure all those other things are in order too sometimes. So one day it works and the next day, Jimmy, it's not working. And we have to be curious and look at the whole bigger picture and think of all the possibilities. And not use the C word, but they had the capacity. They could do it yesterday. No, change it for the other C word, curious. A different C word. Yeah. I love it. Can we take a quick moment to think about one of the topics on our list? And I don't know, fam, if you generally think about this. I will say I went through this process with at least one of my kiddos that is a clinical picky eater. And so there is a huge amount of sensory that goes into not only eating, but swallowing and closure and all sorts of different things. And so I wanted to take a minute to talk about food aversion, clinical picky eating, and ARFID, which ARFID comes up in our OCD field enough in terms of one of the co-occurring eating disorders. And I know, Brianna, actually, you specialize in ARFID at CHLA, right? Yes. But I got to say, like, when ARFID comes through our door, it's been to the extreme. So we're hospitalized because they are now failure to thrive. Yeah. Uh, Which is now a new term, and I don't have it memorized yet, but we don't call it failure to thrive anymore. Because that feels awful. And it puts a lot on the patient. The patient's usually like two or or 10 or whatever. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yes. Yes. So there's alternative means going on to help get some nutrition into these children. But going back first, there's typical picky eating, right? And then there's extreme picky eaters or the clinical picky eating. So typical picky eating would be a limited number of like about 30 foods, 30 different foods. And they don't have to be different foods. It could be like chicken in five different ways. That's counted towards your 30, right? Fried chicken, boiled chicken, you know, like roasted chicken, shredded chicken, barbecue chicken. It could be like that. Brianna, I love that boiled chicken made the preferred food list. <laughs> like, what do they like? They like mac and cheese and boiled chicken. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I had to. But then the clinical picky eating is where we're restricted our variety to just about less than 20 foods. With Typical pick eating, you go through food jags. So you may have a food jag where you want peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every day for like a month and then you're done with it, right? And that food will come back in rotation with your typical picky eater. So maybe take a month off and then reintroduce it and it's back into the diet. But with clinical, we go through these jags and they don't ever come back. So then there's the fear. Two is that, okay, well, if we keep eliminating and we're not adding back in, then what do we have left, right? And then with our fed, there's also usually tends to be a trigger with it, right? So when we're looking at our fed, we want to make sure you're going to get a good case history. And we're still, with all of these, we still like to rule out having a swallowing issue, feeding and swallowing issue to make sure that that's not contributing to it. Maybe they're feeling like food is getting stuck, right? But maybe there actually is a narrowing of the esophagus and we need to take a look at it and see if that is a problem or we're having poor propulsion to move the food down. Is it acid reflux? Maybe it's terrible years of acid reflux that we've created a barrier to eating. Maybe it's starting through use and they don't have the words to be like, it feels like food's coming up and I have acid reflux. Adults, we tend to have acid reflux and we still just keep on eating, right? Like it doesn't matter. I'll take it, you know, something afterwards, put on more spice and I'll just keep going. Yeah. But with kids, yeah. we listen to our bodies, right? And these kids with our bed tend to have more interoception. They feel things in their body that maybe we kind of write off, but we don't pay attention to. So maybe there was reflux that had a big problem or severe allergies that caused inflammation in the throat. So they started limiting their diet for survival. But then when we started limiting it, 
that we attach fear with anything else that we try. So there was a physiological, biological reason why we started doing this, but now it's gotten so bad that there's developed this fear to try anything else, even if there is no allergy to it, because all food is bad. So when working with our fit and clinical pick eating, I think it's really significant to work. Like we have your OT, we may work on trying different foods, we'll grade foods, we're trying different exposures. Sometimes now it's even just the sight of food will be a turnoff. So we're tolerating food just being entered in the room. Maybe it's not even at the table. It's just across the table dealing with the smells. And then you're grading it, but you gotta, we got to pair it with that emotional response too and the fear because the fear is real. You can't tell somebody that it's silly to be afraid of food. Fear is real for them. And so we got to acknowledge that and work with that. I know in the hospital, we do have a team, right? We're working with a dietitian, of course, the GI doctor, the primary care doctor, as well as a mental health therapist that is part of our team to work on this and increase the exposure. We're also doing a lot of trying to work on interoception by doing some meditation beforehand, some body listening before we begin any food trials. We're also doing some deep pressure activity to engage the body with more proprioceptive. And also just kind of reflecting with the meditation piece, being like reflecting and listening to what is your stomach saying right now? What is this thing? And like I mentioned earlier, the research on how to work about the interoception is kind of emerging. (laughs) Emerging. That's how we say it's emerging. But they have been pointing to using more of this reflective listening to your body, this meditative, like taking deep breaths and calming down and really actually listening to what it's saying. And acknowledging how it feels. So we're not just saying ignore it, ignore it, but acknowledging that you do have that sense of what your gut's telling you or what other things may be saying, as well as this idea of proprioception. So you feel your body differently. Either it can help you ground and fill your body, or it can help dissipate some of that intense feeling you have when you engage in the proprioceptive input. Yeah, it's interesting too. I can see how just right OCD could also be opportunistic here. And if we're so in tuned or hyper in tuned, and this can happen too within our autistic community, it can happen for anyone to our interoceptive cues because we really rely on getting that right to feel okay, accepted in our environment, then we might start to spiral around some of these different fear responses as well. I can speak just even for myself. I have celiac disease. And when I got scoped initially for that, they did not initially say celiac disease. They were doing further testing. So I was still eating gluten and celiac disease. You literally cannot have gluten or your body just fights, fights yourself. And so I remember being in California. We were visiting family and I had some kind of sandwich. I don't know, but gluten was involved. And all of a sudden I felt like I was choking. And then I started to have this interoceptive really fear. And as a person with lived experience of OCD, I could really see in hindsight how my OCD was like, you never know when you're going to start choking. And what if you choke? What if that means you're going to die? And you can just imagine there was certainly something physiological going on because I had an autoimmune disease and I couldn't deal with the gluten. But I mean, the places my brain would go with that, I'm like, maybe, maybe I had inflammation during the scope and health OCD starts coming in, or there can be so many different pieces. And so it can then impact your fear around food, your fear around eating, even your fear around swallowing. Oh my gosh, I kind of felt like there was a lump in my throat. Does that mean that something's happening? Is my esophagus going to close? And we can start to have that bubbling up concern. And so it's such a, such an important point. And I think a misunderstood point, but also I see across just with other parents that I know of autistic children there can be a difficulty in accepting different new foods. And we want to normalize that you have to introduce a food sometimes up to 20 times before a kid will really take it. But I think, especially in these different parenting groups and people share on social media and look how much little Tommy loves his peas and we just think like it should be an introduction and they love it. And if it's not, Now we have a picky eater, and that's usually not what we mean by picky eating. As you said, Brianna, it it, it looks very, very different. But there's so many different sensory pieces even to, you know, what is a veggie straw? It's very crunchy and it's hard versus what is mashed potatoes and it's mushy and it's a different swallowing experience, etc. And so there's so much sensory that goes into that as well. 
Anybody else have any thoughts on ARFID or picky eating? One of the reasons that a lot of times neurodivergent people report that they tend to not like certain food groups, especially like fresh foods, fruit, vegetables, things like that, is because it's inconsistent. You know, you have one banana and it's it's more firm. The next one's more squishy. It's less ripe. One blueberry is a little bit more tart. It's less consistent. And so you can understand how sometimes people who are autistic might do a little bit better with consistency. So one of the things about when I'm working with people with our fed, I am usually doing, again, that functional analysis. Is this sensory stuff? Is this more of an OCD thing. I think about it in terms of two subtypes. We've got like the longer term restriction, which is more indicative of like sensory aversions, could be the appearance, the smell, the texture, the taste. Shorter term might be more indicative of because of a fear of a negative consequence, like choking or vomiting or stomach pain or an allergic reaction. They may have had some type of food trauma recently. It may be something like that. And, and it may not have been with that specific food. It may be generalizing. And so I'm going to approach that differently. For parents, I like to use space, supportive parenting for anxious childhood emotions. But again, I'm always kind of considering if this is something that's more of a sensory aversion, I'm going to kind of alter that type of treatment because we know that a lot of sensory stuff, particularly autistic people, don't tend to habituate in the way that neurotypical people or allistic people do when it comes to sensory stuff. The brain, they've kind of done some MRI studies and it just doesn't habituate in the same way. So what I am going to do is I'm going to suggest that maybe you put out a buffet of things and we don't necessarily like push some of those foods, but we put out a buffet and we let them pick from some of those items. I know that that might create a little bit of more work, but if everybody is putting what's on their plates and you kind of encourage, hey, anybody just get what you want, put it on the table or whatever. And that way that person has more, that child has more agency. And over time, they may start to put more on their plate and that might help. But when I start to get a lot more concerned and we start to need a little bit more of that immediate medical intervention as when we're seeing that BMI is less than 75%. And that's when we're talking about kind of like what Brianna's saying, like that hospitalization or that really intensive outpatient. And you're going to need multiple people on your treatment team. If you're seeing that, you know, your child or yourself, like you've stopped your menstrual cycle, those kinds of things. But in general, I think it's important to remember that picky eating is fairly common, especially in kids. It doesn't even necessarily mean neurodiversity. I think the statistics something like, like up to like 50 percent of kids and about 58% of them outgrow within like two years. So if you're not seeing them being really under BMI, if you're not seeing that like, hey, like it seems like they're having a ton of like nutritional deficiencies. If it doesn't seem like they're not growing and they're having issues with their menstrual cycle, if that's applicable, it might be one of those things where again, you can encourage, you can put those options out for them. But the more that you try to push on some of those things, you might actually be causing the opposite because you're taking away agency, especially if there's kind of that PDA type of thing going on. Yeah. Yes, Brianna. I just wanted to say we also like to use the Stouter's division of responsibility when we're talking with families who don't have much autonomy. Right. We strip a lot of it away. And the two things that they can really be in charge of is what goes into their body and what comes out of their body. Like Amen. that's, Amen. that's Amen. about it. <laughs> and so we talk a lot about the parents' responsibility. What they can do is decide what should be offered and what time you offer it. It's up to the child to decide if they want to eat it and take it in. And I think that a lot of what we think is like we age out of it, right, is that it just becomes more acceptable as adults. It becomes acceptable to narrow your diet. And there's so many socially acceptable camps you can be in, right? I can be a vegetarian, I could be a pescatarian, I could be a vegan, I could be, you know, like there's so many different camps that it becomes more acceptable because no one else is making the food for you. It's all on you. So you do what you want, you know, and it, and it works and it's socially acceptable now, but it's hard. And I think it, also drives from the moment you're born and where you go home with your baby and anyone, anyone ever asks you is how much do they weigh? And 
<laughs> how much did they grow? <laughs> it all really matters. And every time you go to the doctor's office, I think it already sets the tone as a parent to be like, this is my one job is to yes. make sure you eat. It has to be a variety. And I can't tell you like how many times I think back and I'm like, my sister only ate cereal. I don't know. And she's an attorney and does great in life. So, with, you know, <laughs> but I understand when it does become a bigger deal. I do worry about our girls who have ARFID, who get really restrictive because even if it stops their menstrual cycle, but even if as they bleed, I worry about iron levels and not getting the proper nutrition and what that could do. So there's definitely, that's an area of concern. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Okay, fam. So again, this has been absolutely amazing, chatting and learning along with these amazing humans, and I'm so incredibly grateful for their time. And we are now entering into my intrusive thought segment, which is my application segment of the show, because fam, I am a big fan of creating some cognitive feedback loops. What's that mean? It means it's where I want to take what was helpful and figure out a way to apply it here and now. But we're individual and we're unique. So that might look a little different for each of us. So today I'm doing something a little different. I'm shaking it up just a bit because I'm going to invite my amazing panelists to share along with us, fam. Sometimes our brains can just go blank or we can struggle to know like how or what we can draw upon from the conversation IRL. Am I right? So let's do this one together, shall we? I'm going to ask the panelists, what is something from our chat? that we can use to anchor ourselves in some hope. Fam, feel free to take some time to think about it, but let's check in with our amazing crew and let them get the ball rolling. As we wrap up, I would love to go around and just provide some closing remarks. Maybe something that was interesting that you found as a key takeaway from our time together, but also hope for the fam. Like, What is something, if a listener is walking away with one piece I have a feeling functional behavioral analysis will be on that bingo card. But if, if you could walk away with one piece from this conversation, what hope would you give family members out there listening, wanting to help their loved ones? I can jump in first. I'll say that. I know when it comes to like OCD and ticks and threats, it can feel so overwhelming and confusing for a lot of people. But I just want to say that before the 70s, there really wasn't treatment for OCD. And the first big randomized controlled trial for CBIT for ticks was in 2010. So this is like, there's been so much progress in terms of how we understand some of these experiences and disorders and how we treat them. And I think in the next couple of years, it's going to get even better and better. And there's, there's so much just like science-based good help out there and good people. And Nicole, I so appreciate your podcast and you putting all this stuff out there and informing people and it is all good stuff. So just wanted to express some gratitude for the space. Thank you. I think take it word that Amber used earlier, like a renaissance, right? There is so much that is coming out and evolving and we're learning that I can only hope for all there is to continue to come and make people walk away knowing that there is hope, that there is support out there. And then the, the replacement of the C word, right? It's not capacity, it's not control. Let's look at curiosity and compassion because that's going to help us like move mountains with regards to this. So we could continue this conversation for hours. We could. I'm sure it's just so cool. And so I really appreciate you bringing everybody together. Absolutely. And I, I appreciate all the extra C words because we're coming up with some great ones. I, I love that. I love that. Amber? I really appreciate the opportunity to just get together and talk about all the overlap. And it has helped me too to kind of Again, functional analysis when I am with my clients, what's what? I would say my takeaway would be when you're having thoughts, your should statements about yourself, your children, your family members, just examine where's this really coming from? Is it necessary? Can I just throw this out? Can, can, I, can I make my own? Where's this coming from? That would be my takeaway. Yeah, I love that. Okay, Brianna. This has been an incredible experience and I'm just so happy to be part of it. I think the my takeaway moment is understanding we all have a central nervous system that responds and drives us to do all sorts of different behaviors. And it serves a purpose. And like we've said, being curious on what drives it and acknowledging that part of it for yourself, for your loved one, for your child, whoever's in your space, because it's serving a purpose. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. 
but how do we move forward with it and listen and acknowledge that something's driving it and get listen to our body and give our bodies what we need. I love that. I love that. That's beautiful. And it's so validating too. Just it, it goes back to that acceptance piece of like just, you know, embrace who you are. We're all individuals. We all are gonna have different things that motivate us and invigorate us and regulate us and other things that definitely won't. So I, I think one of my main takeaways, I put it in like all caps after Amber said it, is like how different would life be if I started with what's my glimmer today? Or for any client, it's like, what's your glimmer today? I used to do reflective supervision with clinicians in our zero to five program back in LA. And we would always talk about what's the moment of joy this week? Because so often we're dealing with, you know, how can I help with this complex case and there's more resource needs here? And what else can we do? And it's like, oh, wait a minute, like we can start with this moment of joy. We can look at this glimmer. And it, it even ties back to what you were saying, Amber, of where is this coming from? Is this what other people want for their glimmer? Because my glimmer doesn't have to be their glimmer. And I just think it's a beautiful reminder. So thank you to my esteemed panel. This has been, it's been so wonderful. And it feels like just yesterday we were all chatting and here we are being able to come together and bring together our knowledge from these different scopes to not only help the fam here, but I, I feel like this has really helped me professionally as well in terms of expanding my understanding. So thank you everybody so much for your time. And I'm going to have all the resources and the links and so you can find out about them fam over on this episode's blog at OCDFamilyPodcast.com. But just super appreciative. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Okay, fam. So you've heard our panelists and my thoughts. Whether it's a glimmer regarding emerging research, accepting our central nervous systems, or even just pretty things, where can we anchor and share hope? So now it's your turn. Where can you hang your hope? And do me a favor. Either write it down. Yes, I know. But hear me out. Write it down. Or... Say it out loud. Breathe life into it, fam, because there is so much hope available, and I'll look forward to exploring more of it with you next week. Thank you for joining me and our OCD family community. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please like and subscribe to the OCD Family Podcast wherever you enjoy your podcasts. Did you find this content helpful? Please consider leaving a review. The more people that know they're not alone, the better. For more information regarding today's podcast, please visit ocdfamilypodcast.com and remember to join the email list while you're there. It will provide you with the most up-to-date information, resources, and the download on the family chatter. Oh yeah, nothing says family. Like Max, Brianna, Amber, Lisa, and me talking all things sensory. That's right, I went there. And you can too at ocdfamilypodcast.com.